All right, you guys. So we have quite a bit to cover tonight, so we're just going to get right into it. I'm sorry for those of you who are expecting like a funny little introduction, but we're not going to do that. Uh, so the title of tonight's message is, uh, Are You Debt Free? Are You Debt Free? So if you're taking notes, that's going to be our title, Are You Debt Free? Uh, so what I want you guys to do, because we are going through the Gospel of Matthew, we're going through the Sermon on the Mount right now. So what I want you to do is I want you to uh, put a bookmark on Matthew chapter 6. Those are, that, that's where we are in, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. So put a bookmark there. Um, but we're going to be starting in Romans tonight. We're going to be starting our study tonight in Romans. So if you would please open up after you find the bookmark uh, in Matthew 6, open up to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I wanted to spend some time looking at something extremely important, something that is so incredible and, and so wonderful. Uh, this thing, it's, it's, it's the reason that those of us who believe are even here right now, and that's God's forgiveness. We're going to be talking about God's forgiveness. In Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, it says, How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, how joyful is a person whom the Lord does not charge with iniquity. God has forgiven us. God has forgiven us, and we are joyful. How joyful we are. God does not charge us with iniquity. He has removed our sin from us, and we are joyful. Are we not, those of us who have been forgiven, are we joyful? That's what I'm talking about. The things that brought about our condemnation, our sinful thoughts and our sinful deeds, these things produced a debt for us. They produced a debt. We owe God. We owe God a debt because of all of the ways that we have sinned against him and attempted to rob him of his glory. We have a certificate of debt. We owe God. But Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us, and he has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. We're starting off with the gospel tonight, in case you're wondering. We're starting off with the gospel. Let's, let's get this understood before we get into our text. For all of you believers in here, for all of you who used to believe, but now you're walking in a way that you are just following yourself, and for maybe you non-believers who might be in here, or any non-believers that may be watching this later, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. We're all born dead in our trespasses and sins. We're all born with this propensity to obey the sinful inclinations of our hearts. And we are all, by nature and by birth, children of wrath. There is none righteous, not even one. No one truly seeks God. No one truly does good. We all go our own way, and we all do what is right in our own eyes. And the Bible declares that all who live this way which is all of us, are earning compensation for ourselves. We are earning compensation. We are working very hard at our sins, and the payment that we will receive for our hard work is death. The wages of sin is death. That's what we are all earning because we have all fallen so woefully short of God's perfect standard. But God who is rich in mercy and because of his great love that he has for us. He made us alive. He made us alive even though we were dead in our trespasses. And this most definitely is not from our works. It's not. No one can boast about this salvation that we have, this forgiveness. For we are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from ourself. This is God's gift. It's a gift of God. Yes, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord, because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but instead they would have eternal life. Amen. Amen. And he makes this available to us for free. It's free. We receive this free gift by faith, by believing that it's true, by believing that he is true, and that faith will make us new. We can be forgiven. We can be forgiven. When we come to him, acknowledging the debt that we owe, the debt that we owe to who? The debt that we owe to him, and we humble ourselves and trust in his mercy, he takes that debt that we owe and he nails it on the cross. By our faith, 
He takes our dead, sinful bodies. He makes us new. He makes us alive through forgiveness. His forgiveness gives us new life. I mean, just before stating in Colossians chapter 2 that, that he nails our certificate of debt to the cross, Paul says this in Colossians 2.13. He says, And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision in your flesh, he made you alive with him, and he forgave us all our trespasses. This is the good news. Our sin separates us from God. It makes us indebted to him, and he will collect on that debt one day. But his love for us moved him to provide a way for that debt to be forgiven. And not, and, and, and not only that, he also remakes us. He remakes us into what we were always supposed to be, which was perfectly righteous. We were always supposed to be perfectly righteous. Because not only does he take away our sin and debt through the cross... He also gives us his own righteousness and his own perfection so that we can stand before him. He is able to make us stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy. He has rescued us who believe. He has rescued us. And he can rescue all of you in here who maybe don't believe. But he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and he has transferred us into the kingdom of his son. In Christ, we have redemption. We have been bought back by God. And we have forgiveness of sins in Christ. We have been forgiven. Those of us who have come to God in faith, and we have been forgiven of so much. We've been given, forgiven of so much. We must always keep in mind that God is holy. Always keep in mind that God is holy. He is nothing like us. Nothing about us can compare to God. He is holy. He is righteous. He isn't simply perfect as an adjective. Like, he is perfection. He is perfection itself. He is the standard. And given that, it only takes one single microscopic imperfection to fall infinitely short of his glory. There's no such thing as someone missing the mark more than you. No such thing. There's no such world where we can justify ourselves by saying, well, that person's a rapist. I only lie, so I'm better off than they are. No. Nah. Missing the mark is missing the mark. One minuscule, nanoscopic, incy weensy itty-bitty, infinitesimal sin will give you the same condemnation that the largest, most grotesque, and most horrendous sin will give you. Why? Because of who we are sinning against. So no matter how you may view yourself or how others may view you, the forgiveness that was extended to you to all of you, it is of infinite worth and magnitude. If you have been given the right to be called a child of God because you have received Jesus and you believe in his name, you have been forgiven of much. Infinite. You have been forgiven of much. And since we've been forgiven, there's no longer anything held against us. Nothing held against us. We are free from condemnation. We are free from guilt. We are redeemed. We are justified. By God's own decree, we are righteous. He has declared us righteous. Amen. So with all that said, let's look at Romans chapter 5, verse 1. It says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith... We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's another thing that we have. we have. We have peace with God. We're not at war anymore. We are at peace with him. We're his kids. We are his kids. And it's through our Lord Jesus Christ. But not only peace. Verse 2. We have also obtained access through him, that's through Jesus, by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Paul is emphasizing here further that the only reason we have been given access into this grace is through Jesus, and specifically our faith in Jesus. And this is what we boast in. 
This is what we boast in as believers, the hope that we have been given through our faith in Jesus. We boast in that. We're proud of that. We're not proud of our works. Our works give us nothing. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags in God's sight. We don't boast in, his, in, in, in our work. We boast in his work, in his grace. How do you know you're good enough for heaven? <laughs> because Jesus was good enough for heaven, and he gave me all of his righteousness. That's how I know I'm good enough for heaven, because of Jesus. But let's continue. We boast in Jesus, verse 3. And not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance, endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, I see, I see indistinctly, as in a dull mirror. But when I get to heaven, I'm going to see face to face. Right now, I, I know in part, but when I get to heaven, I will know fully. This describes all of us believers. Us believers, we are not children. We are not children who don't understand the difficulties that this walk can present. We're not children who moan and complain and who cannot reconcile the presence of difficulties and afflictions in this Christian walk. Though we don't see fully, we see enough to understand that afflictions or tribulations or difficulties or sufferings or however you want to describe it, they're for our benefit. You know, we looked at this a little bit last week. Sometimes this walk will be difficult the road that leads to the narrow door is difficult. Jesus said it himself. We need to look past the visible circumstances and the visible difficulties and look at what God, try to look at what God is trying to accomplish. This is why we boast in our afflictions. That's why we consider it great joy whenever we experience various trials, regardless of the circumstances. We know that God will not disappoint us because he has proven himself through his love for us. As I said in my prayer, the gospel makes it clear to us that God is good and that he will not disappoint us. He has poured out his love into our hearts by pouring himself into our hearts, his Holy Spirit. God has given us a down payment of the hope and the glory that we will, that we will one day receive from him in full. And that down payment is the down payment of, the, of, of love through his Holy Spirit. And just how strong is this amazing love through his Holy Spirit? Well, let's, let's go over to Romans chapter, we're still in chapter five. Let's go down to verse six. Let's continue in verse six. It says, for while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. While we were his enemies, while we were undeserving, while we had no hope and no right to request any mercy, he proved his love for us and he died for us. And because he died and because he rose again and because he opened our eyes to see him as worthy, as Lord, as master, and because we have come to him in faith, we are now his kids. He has adopted us. And if there are any non-believers in here, you, you can be adopted too. You can be adopted too. You can be his kid too. So now that we're his kids, we're practically perfect, right? Like practically speaking, like we're, we're perfect, right? Like in all of our actions and because we are his children, we live perfectly, don't we? As his kids, right? So there's no more need for his grace and his forgiveness, right? Like, we're, like now that we have it, we're good. We're perfect. We don't mess up. Of course, that's not the correct way to, to view things or to view ourselves. 
as Paul continues in this letter in Romans chapter 6 and, and 7, he writes about how we need to walk in this new life. We need to walk in this new life that we have in Christ. We need to understand that our, our old sinful self was crucified with Christ and God has raised us up as a new creature. We walk in the light now. We don't walk in the darkness anymore. We have been set free from our slavery to sin, so now we are to make ourselves slaves of God's righteousness. But then Paul goes on to write that there is a principle that though the desire to do the right thing is now inside of us, there is this indwelling sin. There's this indwelling sin that lives inside of us that still wants to do evil. There's a battle going on. There's a battle. We want to do the right thing, but the flesh wants to do the sinful thing. And this battle is exhausting, and it's discouraging at times. Paul, Paul even writes, what a wretched man I am who will save me from this body of death. But the hope comes from what follows. He says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus rescues us from these bodies of death. Jesus makes cleansing and forgiveness infinitely possible and infinitely available to us. We will stumble and fall even as believers. 1 John 1a, it says, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So we still have practical sin that is being removed from us. Don't get it twisted. Just because there's indwelling sin doesn't mean you just automatically, well, this is who I am. I'm going to keep looking at pornography. No, 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 no. We have practical sin that is being removed from us. And every instance of sin won't be fully removed practically until we are with him forever in heaven. But until then, there will still be some sin present with us. But 1 John 1.9, it says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's forgiveness is never ending for his children. It's never ending for his children. His forgiveness is as unending as he is. It's as infinite as he is. Romans 5.20, it says that when sin multiplied, that grace multiplied all the more. And when Paul wrote those words, he was writing from the context of the law of God making us aware of sin uh, from a pre-forgiveness and pre-salvation place. So now imagine how great and expansive the grace and forgiveness of God is now that we are his kids. If, if pre-forgiveness and, and, and pre-salvation, when sin abounded, grace abounded all the more, how much more now that we have been saved and forgiven and we are his kids, when sin abounds in our lives, his grace is still going to abound all the more. Turn your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 18 so that we can really drive home the magnitude of God's forgiveness of our debts. We've looked at Matthew 18 before at Zeal, but it's worth looking at again and again and again. Matthew 18. And we're going to start in verse 23. This is Jesus speaking. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he did not have the money to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the servant fell face down before him and said, be patient with me and I will pay you everything. And then the master of that servant had compassion, released him, and forgave him the loan. So this, we'll, we'll pause there. So this servant owed this king 10,000 talents. How much money is that? How much money is 10,000 talents? Well, that's the equivalent of 150,000 years worth of wages. Can we even fathom how much money that is? Like, that is a huge amount of money. In our culture, typically people, they work, you know, 30 to 40 years, and then they retire. So, so, like, imagine working 40 years of your life, never collecting a single penny from any of your paychecks. You're, 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 everything is going to this insurmountable debt that you owe. And when you're done working at the end of 40 years, you haven't even made a ripple in the water of this debt that you owe. 
depending on where you look and, and how the source interprets the data that's out there, the average income in America is, is around $70,000. $70,000 annual salary, that's the average in America. So 150,000 years of $70,000 a year, that is $10.5 billion. $10.5 billion. Imagine you had to pay back a debt of $10.5 billion without a capitalist economy, for, for my capitalists out there, without a capitalist economy, as a servant, ain't no side hustles. You're not, you're not garage selling on the weekends and flipping on eBay. No, none of that. Imagine paying back a $10.5 billion debt. 150,000 years of wages. Of course, this represents the debt that we owe God. This represents the debt we owe God. We owe a debt that we cannot afford to pay. No matter how much you try, no matter how hard you work, you can't pay this debt off. You, you are this servant. Every single one of us is this servant in this parable with this unpayable debt. And the only hope you have is to fall on the mercy of your king. In the parable, the servant said, be patient with me. I will pay you everything. I can imagine the king just kind of like, really? Like, no, you're not going to pay back that debt, dude. Like, I know what you make. You ain't paying back that debt. But the servant, this servant, he understood. He understood and he agreed that he did owe a debt. He did owe this debt. In the same way that all who come to God, they must understand and agree that they owe God a debt. And the fact is that though we do owe God a debt that we cannot pay, just like the king in this parable, God has forgiven us our debt. He took the bill of debt, the certificate of debt. He ripped it up. He pushed it away from us. He cast it as far as the east is to the west. He cast it into the depths of the sea. It has been removed. Our debt is gone. He has forgiven us. And now, and now, God is looking at you and me, believers, He's looking at you and me, those of us who believe and who have been forgiven of this unsurmountable debt, and he is telling us to do the exact same thing. He is telling us to do that exact same thing. The question could be asked of God, hey God, has anyone ever sinned against you? Has anyone ever offended you? Has anyone ever hurt you, God? Has, has anyone ever violated you? Has, has anyone ever said or done something to you that has fallen short of your standard of what is acceptable? And he would say, absolutely, they all have. Every single one of them have. But my forgiveness is available to all of them. And so now, the question is asked of you. Has anyone sinned against you? Has anyone offended you? Has anyone hurt you? Has anyone violated you? Has anyone said or done something to you that has fallen short of your standard of what is acceptable? If so, what is your response? What is your response to those who have done these things against you? I hope it's the same response that God has, because that's what he expects. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. In this portion of the letter, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is telling the Ephesians that they need to be united. He's telling them, be united by the Spirit through the bond of peace. He's telling them to accept each other in love. He's saying that we all have a job to do in the local church, and we need to do it. He's telling them that they need to walk like Jesus, not how they used to walk, that in Christ, they have to put on the new self. He's telling them to be truthful, to put away anger, to work to work, work for your livelihood, to keep your language clean and encouraging. So let's begin in verse 30, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. It says this, and don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. 
Verse 31, let all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you along with all malice and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. There's really no explanation needed for these verses. Just read it and understand the words that are in plain English. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't be bitter or angry. Watch your hot temper. Don't be loudly argumentative. Don't speak ill of others. Instead, be kind and compassionate and forgive one another. Forgive one another just like God forgave you. The large debt that God forgave you of, you do the same thing to others who are indebted to you. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Just a few books to the right. Colossians chapter 3. In this portion of the letter, Colossians chapter 3, Paul is telling the Colossians a similar thing that he was telling the Ephesians. Their lives are in Christ and they need to focus on him. They need to put to death their old self and then all the things that they used to do in sin. They need to live for Jesus. He tells them, don't be angry. Don't be hot-tempered. Don't wish ill on others. Don't speak ill of others. He's telling them to keep their language clean. Once again, speaking to somebody. And he tells them that in Christ, they are all one and united. And this is what he goes on to say or write in verse 12, Colossians 3, verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Again, self-explanatory. Be compassionate to each other. Be kind, be humble, be gentle, be patient with each other. Forgive each other. Forgive each other. And Paul even adds, forgive each other if anyone has a grievance against another. Like, this isn't just like a general forgiveness, like a, like a macro level forgiveness. Like, there's just an, there's a, there's a vibe of forgiveness in the air and we're all just breathing it in. No, this is real forgiveness that you are to extend to people who have done harm to you, who have offended you. You have a grievance against them. He's saying, forgive them. There's a reason to forgive them. Why? Because just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. The Lord has forgiven you an unpayable debt. Yes, I'm going to keep repeating that. The Lord has forgiven you an unpayable debt, and you are likewise to do the same thing to those around you and forgive their unpayable debt to you. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. It's back to the left. And like I said last week, man, if y'all ain't bringing your Bible to the Bible study and you're a Christian, you need to be bringing your Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. In this portion of the letter, Paul is addressing someone in the church who was in sin. And it's not known who Paul is, is talking to or talking about. Commentators think that it might have been somebody who he wrote about in his first letter to the Corinthians, somebody who was caught up in some gross sexual sin. Um, or, or they believe, commentators also believe, that it could have been someone who, who challenged Paul's apostleship, um, and they were wrong in their challenge of his apostleship. Uh, but the challenge had uh, negative consequences in the body of Christ. And, this, and if it was the, the guy who was in gross sexual sin, that also had negative consequences for the body of Christ. Whatever the case, there was hurt. There was hurt in the church because of this person's actions. And now this person was apparently repentant of their sin. This person had come to a place of repentance. This person had been, uh, he had undergone church discipline for his actions. And this is what Paul had to say, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. He says, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused pain, not so much to me, but to some degree, not to exaggerate, to all of you. This punishment by the majority is sufficient for that person. As a result, you should instead forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, he may be overwhelmed by excessive grief. So Paul is saying, regardless of who was hurt or how much hurt there was, 
Now it's time to forgive this person. Why? Because we don't want this person to be beaten down by grief, by the grief of knowing what they've done and how they've harmed people. Forgive them for their sake, is what Paul is saying. But let's continue to verse 10. It says, anyone you forgive, I do too. For what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, it is for your benefit in the presence of Christ. Verse 11. So that we may not be taken advantage of by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. One of the schemes of Satan to destroy the body of Christ is through unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. The proud, arrogant, quickly forgetting how much you have been forgiven unforgiveness. This is his tactic. So, extending forgiveness, it's not only for the sake of the person in need of forgiveness, it's also for the sake of the church, for the church as a whole, for the body as a whole, the unity of the church, the strength of the church. Any unforgiveness that you may be carrying is hurting the body of Christ as a whole. And of course, it's hurting you as well. I've heard the saying, I'm going I'm to butcher the quote, but unforgiveness is the poison that the person who holds it intends to use it on the person that they're not forgiving, but instead they're the ones who are actually drinking it. Unforgiveness is a poison. Let's go back to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. We're going to continue the parable that Jesus was giving. We're going to see how unforgiveness can, can hurt you. So this servant, just to reiterate in case any of y'all forgot in the past 10 minutes what we've been looking at, um, this servant owed his king and master, he owed him 10,000 talents, the equivalent of 150,000 years of wages, an unpayable debt to say the least. Uh, but the king, after hearing the pleading from his servant, he had compassion on him and he decided to forgive his debt. Rather than justly, he would have been completely justified in punishing this servant for his irresponsible debt uh, that he accumulated, and he was clearly unable to pay. But let's continue, Matthew 18, verse 28. So that servant, that servant who had been forgiven, that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him, and said, pay what you owe. At this, his fellow servant fell down and began begging him, be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. Instead, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other servants saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported it to their master everything that had happened. Then after he had summoned him, after the king summoned him, his master said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? So this servant, after being forgiven of an unbelievable debt, goes out and finds one of his fellow servants, another servant of the same king, and he begins to shake him down and demand what he owes. You need to pay what you owe, which was 100 denarii, which was the equivalent of 100 days worth of wages. So if we're going to use the 70000 a year example, uh, that the guy owed him about $20,000, $20,000. That's not a small amount of money. That's, that's, that's a good amount of money, but nowhere near, nowhere near what he owed to the king. As a reminder, 10.5 billion. The fellow servant can't pay. And so the, the first servant, the forgiven servant, he has his fellow servant imprisoned for his debt. The other servants, they see this, they go tell the king, and the king is understandably angry with his servant, telling him, dude, I forgave you such an unpayable debt. I forgave you such an unpayable amount of debt, yet you didn't even have enough mercy to forgive your fellow servant. How proud and arrogant of this servant. He was forgiven of so much, a debt that he would never be able to pay. There is no situation in which this servant was ever going to be able to pay this debt, yet he was forgiven. And when it came time 
for him to extend a similar mercy. I'm not even going to say that he had to extend the same mercy because it wasn't the same mercy. The amount of debt that the servant was forgiven was incomparable. Like, how do you grasp that? $10.5 billion compared to 20,000 is such a large difference. Just to give you an idea of the, of the difference, if you looked at these numbers as, as uh, fragments of time, if you looked at these numbers as seconds, okay, 20,000 seconds is less than 14 days of time. Almost two weeks. It's a good amount of time, right? Vacation. Two weeks. 10.5 billion seconds. Anyone want to guess? Five years. Five years. 10.5 billion seconds would be the equivalent of almost 20 years of time. 20 years of time. The difference is startling. That is a huge difference. So this servant, he didn't have to extend the same mercy that was extended to him. His debt to the king was far greater. He just needed to extend a level of mercy that was well within the confines of the mercy that was shown to him by this king. But he didn't. He didn't. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Let's look at the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. What is poor in spirit? What does that mean? It's understanding your deep spiritual poverty. It's understanding your deep spiritual poverty. You know that you have nothing. You have nothing to offer God that would make you good enough. You are crouching in fear in a corner because you understand the severity of your sin in light of his all-consuming fire of holiness and glory. But when you understand that, when you understand how spiritually bankrupt you are before God, you understand that, man, I have no choice but to trust in his grace and his mercy. And in that trust kingdom of heaven is yours. But how can one who knows their impoverished position before God dare not extend a lesser grace and mercy to their fellow sinner? Matthew 5 verse 7 says, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. It's pretty clear. If you show mercy, you will be shown mercy. And if you, and if you have been shown mercy, then you ought to show mercy. Matthew 5, verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. If you are harboring unforgiveness in your heart, you are not at peace with your fellow sinner. And if you are not at peace with your fellow sinner, and you are refusing to go and make peace with your fellow sinner, then you cannot be called a child of God. Because it's the peacemakers who are blessed, for they will be called sons of God. But let me tell you something about forgiveness. Let me tell you something about mercy. When God forgives us, when God forgives us, what does he expect from us? I'm not talking about what does he expect from us for salvation. I'm talking about, okay, look, I have forgiven you this debt. Let me take a break from this idea of, of us having to forgive each other. Let me take a break from that. Let me take a, let me take a sidebar. When you are forgiven of much, God expects you to repent. He expects you to stop doing that sin. Because if he extends forgiveness to you, and you say, oh, great, let me go do it again, you are cheapening his grace, and that is not grace at all. So if God is extending forgiveness to us, he expects us to repent. He expects us to turn away. And he expects us to follow him. Because now we can. A sinner who doesn't know Christ is a slave to sin. They have no choice. But if you sit here today and you call yourself a believer and you have accepted the free gift of salvation, the mercy and the forgiveness of God, according to the Bible, you have been given the Holy Spirit inside of you. Now you can say no to sin. So don't you, don't you go willingly into sin, continuing in sin, and blaming it on anybody other than yourself. You have the power now. End of sidebar, sorry. Uh, so now is, <laughs> let's go look at our main text. Matthew chapter 6. This is where we are 
in our study through the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. It says, And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. This portion of the prayer that we are given in this model prayer by our Lord is asking God to forgive us our debts. Asking God to forgive us our debts. And the assumption, which is pretty clear by the wording, the assumption is that we have also already forgiven those who are in debt to us. He says, forgive us as we have also forgiven. He doesn't say, forgive us our debts as... I work on forgiving some people for the things that they've wronged me. God, you got to understand, they really did me dirty. So I'm just, I'm working through some things, Lord, and I just need some time to dwell in your presence. I need need the spirit to bring bring me to a place of, of being able to forgive this person. No, no, that's not what he says. Imagine if that's how God extended his forgiveness to us. I'll let you know. I got to prepare my heart to forgive you, you know, so just give me some time. I know you're coming to me repentant. You feel, you feel horrible about what you've done, but you just got to give me some space right now. Give me some time. Give me some time. I'm going to work through it. Eventually, I'll get there. But if that verse isn't clear enough of the expectation that is on us to forgive, go down to verses 14 and 15. It says, For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your father will not forgive your offenses. And before we attempt to understand what that means exactly, uh, let's go back to Matthew 18. Let's go back to Matthew 18 and finish this parable. So the servant was forgiven an incomprehensible debt. An incomprehensible debt. He didn't extend the smaller forgiveness to his fellow servant. The king and master was upset, called out his servant for being wicked. So let's continue. Matthew 18, verse 34. And because this king was angry, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So also, my heavenly Father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sister from your heart. Whoa. Whoa. What does this all mean? We are told to forgive our brothers and sisters in the same way that God has forgiven us. In the model prayer, we are told to ask God to continue forgiving us while we are actively living a life of forgiveness towards others, we're not, we're not waiting for more of his forgiveness in order to forgive others. We, we just forgive because we've already been forgiven. We are told that if we forgive others, God will forgive us. And if we don't forgive others, God will not forgive us. And then Jesus, he tells this story to amplify the importance of our responsibility to forgive. And if we don't, we will face a harsh penalty from our father. What does it mean? Well, it can't mean, it can't mean that God's ultimate forgiveness and salvation for us is contingent on our forgiveness for others. That, that would be a works-based salvation. That's not what the Bible teaches. We, we earn our salvation and forgiveness by first forgiving other people. That's not what the scripture teaches. It's by grace through faith. It's a gift of God so that no one can boast. Yeah, I got this salvation because I was able to forgive other people. Nope, that's not how it works. So then what? What does this mean? Well, what's clear to me is that extending forgiveness to others is a characteristic of someone who has been forgiven. Those who have been brought into the kingdom and are born again, believers, have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling inside of them, they will have the ability to forgive the same way that God forgives. That's just how it is. Them's the facts. If you have the Spirit of God in you, you have the ability to forgive. Why? Because you're born again. You are born again. You have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. 
The verses that we read in Ephesians talking about forgiving one another, it's in the context of keeping unity in the body, to diligently keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And the verses that we read in Colossians about forgiving one another, it's in the context of the body of Christ dwelling with each other. And he goes on to write, above all, put on love, the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of the Messiah, to which you were also called into, uh, in one body, control your hearts. In the verses in 2 Corinthians about forgiving, Paul makes it clear that unforgiveness is a tactic of the enemy to break the unity of the body. Jesus Christ loves his body. He died for his body. And the Holy Spirit has been given to us his body so that we can all be united in one spirit and contributing to that unity is the act of forgiving one another. We have to forgive one another. God's people, if they are God's people, will be forgiving people, especially towards each other, especially towards each other. And God takes seriously this command to forgive others. And the forgiveness we extend, it ought to mirror the forgiveness that our Father extends. The very reason Jesus gave this parable in Matthew 18 was to re, it was a response to, to one of his disciples' questions. Peter had a question. Look at what it says in verse 21 and 22. It says, verse 21, it says, Then Peter approached him and asked, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? You know, he thought he was doing something big. Verse 22, I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Again, Jesus isn't saying 490 and that's it. No, I think that's 70 times 7. I'm not sure. I don't have my calculator. But this forgiveness, there's no limit. There is no limit to our forgiveness just as there is no limit to God's forgiveness for us. In the model prayer, Jesus is speaking to his disciples who are already in the kingdom of God and they are already forgiven and he is telling them to continue asking for forgiveness because there would still be a need for it. Not for salvation, but for the washing of their feet that would get dirty as they walked with him. Their bodies were clean. Their bodies were clean, spiritually speaking. But there was still going to be dirt getting on them because of this world and the enemy and the indwelling sin. So there is no limit to God's forgiveness and there is thus no limit to our forgiveness. And you may say, well, am I just supposed to keep forgiving people and letting people hurt me because I'm supposed to always forgive? To that I would say, don't let the exceptional be the reason that you forsake the norm. What do I mean by that? I strongly doubt, I strongly doubt that every, every, every single occurrence of someone sinning against you, or offending you, or insulting you, or doing anything that would present the need for you to forgive them, I highly doubt that every one of those instances is a situation where there was actual, real abuse taking place. I'm not saying that instances of real, actual abuse don't happen. I know that they do, but what I'm saying is that you should not completely ignore this command to forgive indefinitely because there may be instances of having to forgive actual real abuse. With that said, if there has been harmful behavior directed at you, you are required to forgive that, but you're not required to continue putting yourself in that position that led to the abuse. If you're in a relationship where physical abuse is taking place, if you're in a dating relationship, or even if you're in a marriage relationship where physical abuse is taking place, you forgive the abuse. But then you also remove yourself for a time. If you're married, for a time. If you're, if, if you're not married, <laughs> peace. That thing is over. <laughs> But you forgive the abuse, you remove yourself from that relationship, and then you call the police. Because the Bible says that the government does not carry the sword for nothing. They carry the sword to reward good, but also to punish evil. Don't be afraid to use that government. I'm saying. But again, that's, those are exceptional circumstances. Those are exceptional circumstances. Those, those are specific and particular circumstances that I know, I know that they take place. I mean, they took place in Paul's life. 
They took place in Paul's life in the New Testament. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, this is what Paul writes to Timothy. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did great harm to me. The Lord will repay him according to his works. Watch out for him yourself because he strongly opposed our words. Paul was harmed by this man, Alexander the coppersmith. This guy did great harm to Paul. And, and this guy strongly opposed the words that Paul was preaching. His opposition to Paul led him to behave violently. And Paul was telling Timothy, hey, be careful with this guy. Be careful around him. So, so there are instances where, where we need to proceed with caution, right? We need to proceed with caution after forgiveness. If someone were to physically attack me, I would forgive them. But the next time they're around, I'm going to maintain a safe distance. Six feet, right? No, 20 feet. Andy, what is it, 20? You know, enough to draw the weapon and, I'm just kidding. Um, no, you know, you're, you're, you're going you're gonna to be cautious if the person physically harmed me. We can be cautious, but we need to temper our caution. Be honest with yourself. Be honest and look at the situation objectively. Be sure that your level of caution and apprehension is proportionate to the level of sin against you. Why does it seem like you're not really hanging around that person? Why, why does it seem like you're avoiding that person? Well, you got to pray for me. I'm working through something. They said that they really enjoyed my homemade peach cobbler, but I found out that they really didn't. They lied to me. So I just, I need some time right now. I need some time. God has to bring me to a place of healing so I can forgive this person. That's not proportionate. That's not proportionate. Doesn't make sense. Of course, that, that, is, that is an exaggerated example. But I'm sure, I am sure that there are people in here who are keeping people at, at arm's length. You know, you, you've put someone in, in forgiveness jail. You know, like, yeah, you've forgiven them, but there's still, there's still something there. You know, there's, it's, not, it's not quite all the way resolved yet. But that response doesn't match the sin that was committed and the repentant heart that you see from the offender. Don't let your feelings disrupt the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. We all have a responsibility to forgive our brothers and sisters and all people. We have a responsibility to forgive all people, no matter what they've done to us. Because you have been forgiven of such a huge amount of debt you have no right to ignore mercy and forgiveness when it comes to your fellow sinner. And if we don't forgive, there will be very, very severe consequences given to us by our Father. He will discipline us with the severity that a wicked servant who refuses to show mercy after having been shown an infinite amount of mercy deserves. There may be some in here tonight who are struggling in their walk you feel like you're lost even though you've been found. You, know, you feel like you're in this cycle of struggle and hardship and suffering. Now, I'm not saying that this is absolutely the case, but maybe, perhaps, there's unforgiveness in your life. And what you're going through, the struggle and the hardship and this cycle that you're going through, is the discipline of a loving father being poured out on his rebellious child. I don't know. But what I do know is that there are issues between brothers and sisters. That's what I do know. I know that. Partly because I just know how humans are. And humans are always going to have problems with each other for some reason. Don't ask me how to fix it because I'm struggling with that too. But I also know that there are problems between brothers and sisters because many of you have come, to me, come up to me and you have asked me, so what do I do about this? I got this, there's this beef between me and a brother, or between me and a sister. And just let me tell you, if, if you have come to me about that, you're not the only one. Trust me, you're not the only one. I know that there are issues between the body. And I also know that there are three sides to a story. There's your side, there's their side, and there's God's truth, that side. And my recommendation to any in here who maybe are, are going through something like that, you're, you're experiencing like this, this weird unforgiveness, tension, unspoken thing, something. There's no peace. And, and there is a root of bitterness or unforgiveness. Get that resolved. Get it resolved. 
Go to your brother, go to your sister, humbly, humbly and seek a resolution. And for anybody who maybe they're gonna be approached by somebody, you be humble too. Be ready to forgive both of you. Be ready to ask for forgiveness, both of you. Because chances are both parties have something that they should have done differently. Chances are. I want to share a personal testimony really quickly. Um, I'm, not spe- I'm not preaching this from a place of not having experienced it. There was a time in my walk where I had to confront a brother. I had to tell him about something. Uh, and, uh, and it went well. At least I thought it did. A few days later... There's, there's this just weird tension. I went to go, I went to go greet this person and, and I, was just, I was met with some weirdness. It was just weird. Like they were upset with me. And I was like, okay, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe some time needs to, to pass, you know, before, you know, because it was a hard conversation, you know? And so some time passes. And I'm like, okay, cool. It's been a few days. We need to get this. This is weird. We shouldn't be having this. This is the body of Christ. So I go talk to this person and man, I don't know what happened. The conversation, it felt like I wasn't even talking to, to a Christian. It felt like I was talking to somebody on the streets. I felt like it was my BC days and I was talking to somebody who was like about to do something, you know? It was weird. And, and, and the conversation didn't even end well. Like it just ended abruptly. It was just like, I'm done with this conversation basically. And the person left and I'm just like, and I remember just standing there and I remember just kind of like grieving in my heart because I knew in that moment, this, this person was upset with me. But as far as I knew, there there was no reason to be upset with me. But that wasn't the main thing. The main thing was like, this person is upset and experiencing whatever they're experiencing when instead they could be experiencing joy. They could be experiencing peace. And it broke my heart. I started to to weep a little bit. Went home, told my wife about it. Started to weep a little bit because I'm just like, it shouldn't be this way. And so then time passes, eventually, talk to this person, and everything gets put out. Everything. We, t- we talk about everything. What, what did you mean when you did this? What did you mean when you said this? Why, why, why when I did this, it seemed like, like we talked about everything. We put it all out there. And what happened was there was resolution. There was forgiveness. I, I mean, honestly, I... There, as soon as the thing was done, that initial conversation, I, the, there was already forgiveness as far as I was concerned. It was like, dude, whatever. Like, whatever's happening right now, I don't care. If you want me to say I'm wrong, that's fine. I'll say I'm wrong just so that we can have the peace. But there was resolution, there was forgiveness, and there was unity in the body of Christ once again. You need to get it resolved. We are to forgive each other the way that God has forgiven us. We are to maintain the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. We are to have a love for one another. We are we're not ignorant of the schemes and the tactics of the devil. We're not ignorant. And if you were, you're not anymore. We are not ignorant of his schemes and tactics. He wants unforgiveness and bitterness and grudges in the body. That's how he tears it down. Don't allow that to happen. Don't be disobedient to God's command to forgive. Fully forgive. He has forgiven us of so much. I'm sorry I'm repeating it again, but it's worth repeating. He has forgiven us of so much. Our debt was unpayable and impossible to pay off. But he paid for it and he forgave us of that debt. How glorious and amazing is his grace. Don't you dare have the pride and the arrogance to think that you have reason to hold something against someone when the God of all creation and the judge of all the earth doesn't hold anything against you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. (sighs) Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your forgiveness. And God, this is a hard thing to say. This is hard. But God, I just pray that if there's any unforgiveness in here, 
God, that you would, you would speak to the people, God. You would speak to those who are harboring unforgiveness and bitterness or grudges or anything like that. Because they're playing right into the devil's hands. It's exactly what he wants. And so, God, I just pray that you would lead these people to repentance by your kindness. It's not the severity. It's not me screaming. It's not... It's not my, my loud voice that is going to bring people to repentance, God. It's, it's your kindness that will bring us to repentance. And so, God, I pray that your kindness would bring your people to that place of wanting to get rid of any unforgiveness or bitterness or anything like that. And God, for those of us who are not currently in that place, Father, I, I pray that the truth of your gospel the truth of how much you've forgiven us, God, that that would keep us humble for when those opportunities come for us to forgive others and that we would choose to forgive, Lord, that we would not hold anything against our brothers or sisters. God, I pray for unity in this body, not just here on Friday nights, God. This, this church that you have here in LA, core church, God, I pray for unity in this body. And I pray for any unforgiveness in this body to be done away with, God. Speak to those who aren't even here right now about the unforgiveness that may be in their hearts. I thank you so much for your love. I thank you for your grace. And I pray, God, that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.